pleasure for me to introduce you to this live presentation of Capelli School of Business and then leave the floor to Dylan. Great, thank you Federica and uh, I know it's 6 p.m. in Europe so <clears throat> good evening to everyone who's in Europe, good uh, afternoon for people who are in uh, you know South America and uh, on the east coast of America. Um, my name is Dylan Mosenthal. I'm the Associate Director of MBA Admissions at Fordham University's Gabelli School of Business. So uh, I primarily oversee the full-time MBA uh, at Fordham University. I do work very closely with our specialized masters as well. So um, it's great to see that there is a, a, a breakdown of, of uh, programs that you're all interested in. Um, and really over the course of this presentation, um, that will be the, the goal as far as the information that I want to, to convey to you all. Um, it, it's gonna be uh, first a deep dive into our MBA program so that you get a sense of, of the curriculum and the experience. Um, I then will talk about our specialized Master of Science uh, programs. Uh, at a macro level, we have, we have a lot of uh, MS programs, uh, 13 in total. Uh, so I'll give you a, a macro level uh, glimpse at, at our specialized masters. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what makes Gabelli different, what makes our business school uh, unique, um, and then I'll wrap up with some information about uh, the, the application process, uh, deadlines, financing your education, and things like that. Um, and as Federica mentioned, please, if you have questions, um, ask away in, in the, uh, the Q&A uh, uh, little section there on Zoom, um, because we're going to dedicate a, a good chunk of time at the end to address your questions. So to launch right in, I'll, I'll start off by giving you uh, an overview of our MBA program. So uh, all in all, we offer three MBA programs, the full-time MBA, the professional MBA, and the executive MBA. Um, and for the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on the full-time MBA. Um, the professional is a, is a working professionals program. So it requires you to be working in New York City and taking classes in the evening. Um, and it, the executive MBA also falls under that category. So. Uh, because uh, the, the audience is, is international, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk specifically about uh, the full-time MBA. Um, and as you can see here, this is just a, a general profile of what the program looks like. So uh, if you boil it down to a typical profile, most full-time MBA students in our program are career switchers, uh, people who are looking to make some sort of pivot uh, in their career. And I use the term pivot. Pivot is a very broad term. There are people who are looking to, to make drastic changes in their career. They're looking to change industry altogether. Um, and then there are people who are looking to, you know, maybe stay in the same industry, but, but change their functional role. Um, but the common thread across all of these students is that they've quit their job to leverage a degree to be able to make some sort of change, okay? And that's really how the full-time MBA student differs from these other MBAs, where in the professional and the executive MBA, they're, you know, these students are not looking to utilize the degree to switch, they're looking to utilize the degree to advance within their, their current company. Um, a couple of other things as far as just general structure for the full-time MBA, so it's a, a two-year cohort-based program, meaning uh, you are with the same group of students when you start the program until when you complete the program. Uh, and I will, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the curriculum uh, on the next slide. Um, and then as far as, as age and work experience, uh, on average, our, the full-time MBA students have about five years of professional work experience. Uh, and uh, the average age is, is around right 28. Uh, we have, that's an average age. We're less concerned with age. We're more concerned with uh, the years of work experience. Uh, to go into the, the curriculum. So um, a lot of full-time MBA programs in the States are similar to this as far as curriculum. So uh, the first year is really dedicated to giving you a foundational business skill set in business, right? So you'll take accounting, you'll take marketing, you'll take finance, you'll take statistics all of the forces that operate on a business, you will be studying in your first year. And that is a required curriculum for all of our full-time MBA students. Um, oftentimes I, I get a, a, an MBA prospect or someone who's looking to get an MBA and they tell me, uh, well, listen, I'm, I'm working, I wanna work in investment banking. I wanna work in finance. Why, why do I have to take a marketing class? Why do I have to take uh, you know, a, a management class? And the reality is, 
as an MBA student, you are, you are uh, receiving a management degree. That's what an MBA degree is all about. Uh, you are going to graduate from your MBA and enter ideally into a middle management type of position. So while you might have a functional role that is specific, say finance, uh, the expectation from MBA employers is that you understand all of the forces on a business. Because as a manager, you have to be able to understand what your accountants are doing, what your marketing folks are doing, um, you know, what your, uh, you know, the people working in, in HR are doing. And so that's the idea. As a manager, you have to be equipped with all of these skill sets, even if what takes up most of your day is one sliver of all of those different forces. Um, so that's what you're doing in your first year. I, I want to point out quickly a couple of, of unique programs that our, our full-time MBA students embark on in their first year. Um, first is Gabelli Launch, which is the, the box there on the top left. Um, that is a pre-orientation program that happens a month before uh, our students actually have their first day of classes. So the first day of classes is usually in you know, the beginning of September. We actually bring our full-time MBA students to New York City uh, end of July um, to embark on this month long of programming that is really designed to help ease the transition into the program. So, uh, you know, you're five days a week, you're working with, you know, the business school on doing data and analytics workshops. Uh, there's an entire week that's dedicated towards uh, career development, doing work with the career, uh, career development staff, um, an entire week dedicated towards leadership development. Uh, and then certainly the, the uh, highlight of this Cabelli Launch Program is a trip abroad. Uh, it's a consulting project, essentially, where students are put into groups of five and they are assigned a nonprofit organization in Argentina. I'd actually, be, I'd, I'd, when we wrap up, I'd love to know if there's anyone uh, from Argentina on this, on this webinar, uh, because we, we spent a good amount of time down there doing these consulting projects uh, over the past couple of years. Um, but the, the long and short of it is you are working with this company all throughout the month of August. And then at the end of August, you, we all fly down to Buenos Aires and we actually uh, give that deliverable in person to these nonprofit organizations. So that's certainly a highlight for the cohort. I think, you know, from the standpoint of, of getting real world consulting skills under your belt right at the start, that's, that gives our students a, a huge advantage, in particular, those that are looking to go into consulting. Um, but I think also from the bonding standpoint, you know, our students come back from Argentina, uh, they know each other extremely well. By the time they've started classes, you know, they, they feel like they, they've known their classmates for, for much longer than only one month. So um, really, I, when we talk to our students at the end of, the, of their experience, they talk about how Argentina was really a formative part um, of their two years at Cabelli. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly point out to this blue box over here, which is the global industry project. So that is essentially a replication of the Argentina trip, except in London. Uh, and the other difference is that as opposed to Argentina, where you're doing consulting for nonprofit organizations, uh, in London, you're doing consulting work uh, with traditional for-profit companies. So Fortune 500 companies, um, et cetera. So uh, the way that consulting project works is it's essentially a class that you're taking. Uh, January through March, you are working on your deliverable for your client. And then uh, during that last week in March, we all travel to London uh, for about a week uh, and travel around London, do some um, you know immersive activities, but then it all wraps up with uh, us giving you know deliverables to these clients in person and on site. So a pretty unique, uh, you know, component of the first year, uh, the fact that you're doing two required global immersions um, that consist of, you know, real world work with companies. Um, it's certainly something that that we pride ourselves in. Uh, so moving on to the to the bottom half of this slide, which is the the internship and the second year. So 99% of our students will do an internship over the summer between their first and the, and the second year. Uh, and the reason why is because as a full-time MBA student, uh, you're looking to get a new job, right? That's the ultimate goal is that you're going to graduate and you're going to have uh, a six-figure uh, salary position that's at an MBA level. 
Um, the only way to do that, or the most effective way to be able to land a job like that, is to secure an internship and have that internship convert into a full-time job. Uh, and I think a lot of students will underestimate that part of the experience. So they think, you know, they, they start in the fall of their first year and they say, well, I don't really have to worry about landing a job until two years from now. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to relax and, and focus on my classes. Um, but that's actually quite the opposite. It's all a, a domino effect as far as your ability to get that job. So securing an internship, that happens very early in your first year. We have students right now in October, they've been here for you know a month, a month and a half, and they're, they've already done four to five interviews for internships. So what's not illustrated on this slide is all of the work that happens in your first year in order to be able to secure one of these really competitive internships. Um, because there are a lot of MBA students out there and um, it is uh, of the utmost importance that our students are securing these internships because as I said, that's the way in which you're able to convert uh, a, a, an internship into a full-time job offer. Um, so after the internship, you start your second year. At the start of the second year, there is already a group of students that already have job offers. They know they're going to be starting as soon as their, their second year wraps up uh, because they've signed a contract. So um, again, I, I, do, I do wanna point that out because I think sometimes students have a misconception about how fast uh, that this whole internship hiring and, and full-time job offer process starts. It really starts before you arrive in New York City, okay? Um, so as far as the academics for your second year, this is when you're able to specialize. So as, uh, as opposed to the first year where you're all taking a fixed uh, curriculum that, that really emphasizes this broad foundation in business, your second year is when you start to, to really tailor the program towards your individual interests uh, and you know, the, the specific skills that you're looking to build um, in the program. So as you can see here, there are eight electives that you will take over the course of the program. Um, and here are the, uh, essentially the categories in which you can take elective courses. So, I, I won't list all of these off. Um, uh, I think you can read them for yourself. But uh, one thing I do want to point out, because I think this is a misconception that a lot of students have, certainly a misconception that I had when I did my MBA, is that I look at this term concentration and I, I liken it to the term major in undergrad, right? I'm, all of you here, you, you pursued an undergraduate degree you officially declare what you were going to study, and that's what you studied. There wasn't really flexibility for you to go and study things outside of that discipline. Um, that is not the case in our MBA program. Uh, these concentrations are, they're merely categories in which elective courses are listed. So uh, while you can take five courses in one of these concentration areas, uh, and, and receive what's essentially a designation on your, on your uh, diploma that says you had a concentration in finance or a concentration in management, about 50% of our students graduate with no concentration because they chose to pick and choose individual elective courses across different disciplines. So just something to, to point out because I think, uh, you know, that degree of flexibility is really valuable, you know. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. I I am by no means uh, someone who is uh, tech savvy or someone who's going to become a programmer. Um, I had no experience doing programming prior to my MBA. I wanted to take a programming class out of the information systems concentration because, I mean, programming has already taken over. It's really the future of business. And I wanted to be able to, uh, uh, at a bare minimum, speak the language of, of coding. Um, it was one of the best classes that I took. It was the only course I took out of information systems. But again, I had that flexibility to branch out and take elective courses across all of these different areas. So um, just something I want to point out because I think a lot of students have those misconceptions when they start. Um, the last thing I will mention uh, as far as uh, STEM certified concentrations and, and you know that ability to get those those extra three years to, to work in the states. So if students uh, uh, complete an accounting, fintech, 
or information systems concentration, their MBA degree becomes STEM certified. So that essentially that requires you to take five out of the eight elective courses in one of those concentration areas, accounting, uh, FinTech and information systems. So I just wanted to, to point that out. Um, as I know, you know, the STEM certification piece is, is extremely important to a lot of our uh, international students. Uh, I, I briefly want to talk about our career development center and our alumni because that is a huge component of, of your MBA experience and, and your specialized master's experience as well. You know, ultimately you come to business school to enhance your career outcomes. Um, so the, the, this emphasis on working with the Career Development Center, networking, doing what you can do to be able to put yourself in a good position to land a job, that is of the utmost importance if you want to get the most out of your uh, MBA or specialized master's degree. Um, so, you know, as far as how the, the uh, Career Development Center works, um, they, they essentially offer two types of services. So one is everything that is your tangible job application skills. So everything that comes from your resume, uh, you know, your cover letters for, you know, when you apply to, a, to a, an internship program or a full-time job, uh, mock interviews, you know, that is a, a huge uh, service that they offer to our students. I think a lot of times our students underestimate how technical a lot of these uh, positions are. And so uh, our career development center staff, they're equipped to know what these companies are going to be asking you in the interviews. And so the more you can go and see them and actually walk through these practice interview sessions, the more likely you are to do well when you're actually face to face with an employer. Um, one thing I, I do want to also note about our Career Development Center staff, all of the counselors that work in career development are people who previously worked in the industry that they, that they uh, represent. So if you want to work in finance, you work with uh, our counselor called Ellen Herman. She's amazing. She's uh, worked for, I think, 25 years as a managing director at an investment bank. So she knows the ins and outs of this industry, right? You're, you're getting really the, 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 the real world perspective on what you have to do to land the job. Um, and that applies for all of our counselors. Kim Lewis Collins, who works with marketing students, she worked as a brand manager at, uh, at uh, Dannon, at uh, Verizon. I mean, she's, uh, you know, she's, uh, was a big wig in the marketing world and she is counseling you one-on-one. -on -one. So I think that's a unique um, you know, way to, to make up our career development center. You're not working with just any person who got hired to work in CDC. These are people who have a breadth of, of work experience in those specific industries. Um, so I mentioned that first category, everything that's tangible job application stuff. Um, but then there's also this other category, which is extremely important, which is networking. Uh, I guarantee you, everyone who comes to business school in the States, you will be so sick of the word networking by the time you graduate. But the reality is, it is so, so important to go out there and make connections. And in particular, at a place like Gabelli, where we are in the heart of New York City, and we are surrounded by companies and surrounded by former students who are working in these companies, uh, you really need to go out there and shake hands and make these connections in order to, to enhance your chances as far as, uh, as, far as landing a job um, that's MBA caliber or, or um, you know, even for our specialized MS students as well. And at the end of the day, the Career Development Center, they're the, the, really the bridge between you and all of these networking opportunities. They're the ones who will put on these uh, you know, industry specific networking uh, receptions, uh, either at the business school or, or somewhere in New York City, where they invite uh, alumni and they invite the current students to come and meet in, you know, an informal setting. Um, they also help you with, uh, you know, getting in touch with alums to meet on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So you identify a list of companies that you're interested in applying to, and they'll come back to you with a list of alumni and they'll say, reach out to these alums. They'll, you know, they'll, they'll be happy to chat with you. So, uh, at the end of the day, those are the two main categories. They're helping you to prepare for an interview, right? Make sure that you get the chance to interview by sending in a good application. They're also putting you in touch with the people 
who can uh, you know, help get your resume put at the top of the pile uh, and essentially get that opportunity uh, to get brought in and, and have a conversation for, for either an internship or a job. Okay, I'm gonna move on to our specialized Master of Science programs. I saw that there were several of you that are interested in, in pursuing one of these MS programs. And really quickly, just to touch upon the difference between an MS program and an MBA program, because that is often a question that I field you know, uh, I, I, do I do a, a, a MS in finance or do I get my MBA and specialize in finance? What is the difference? Um, the main difference is, whereas the MBA is a breadth degree in the sense that it's broad, uh, you're taking all of those foundational courses in your first year, the specialized masters of science programs are a deep dive in a specific discipline. So you're becoming an expert in a, in a specific field. The other big difference is that an MBA program requires work experience, uh, whereas an MS program does not. And, and the typical profile for an MS student is someone who has not worked before. Uh, maybe they've worked one or two years, but uh, the bulk of students are coming straight from undergrad and, and pursuing uh, an MS degree. So certainly from a, an employer perspective, the types of jobs that are available for an MS student, they're gonna be typically more entry level. They're going to be great positions, but employers are coming to you know, our business school and interviewing MS students. They're not looking, they, they don't expect any work experience. So they're looking to hire for jobs that are essentially entry level. MBA programs, very different. They're expecting five, six years of work experience. They're hiring for middle management positions. Um, so that's one thing I'll typically tell students who are, uh, you know, who might have five to six years of work experience and want to do an MS program, I'll tell them that's fine, you'll get a, 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 you know, a great education, you will have to work a little bit harder to find positions uh, that are middle management because the, the hiring process is more for entry level at the specialized uh, MS level. Um, so quickly, just to, to go through uh, these, these buckets, uh, I like to call them buckets as far as where our, our MS programs fall. So we have analytics programs, uh, apply statistics, business analytics, marketing intelligence. Uh, all three of these are STEM certified. Um, uh, a couple of these here you'll see are uh, available part-time. Um, but again, I think for most international students, you, you would pursue these programs full-time. Um, we have information technology, which falls under our business technology bucket. Uh, that is also a STEM certified degree. Within finance, uh, global finance and quantitative finance, uh, those are uh, as well, both STEM certified. Uh, within management, we have our MS in management, MS in media management, and MS in strategic marketing communications. So I, I saw that several of you were interested in an online program. Uh, Strategic marketing uh, communications is predominantly an online program. I will add that the MS in management and the MS in global finance can also be pursued online. So those are the three that you should be looking at as far uh, as, as online options. Um, and then quickly within that management suite, our media management program is STEM certified uh, as well. And then for professional services, we have our MS in accounting and our MS in taxation. Um, and the MS in accounting is STEM certified. So just to quickly wrap up which ones are STEM certified and which ones are not, essentially they're all STEM certified with the exception of the MS in management, the MS in strategic marketing communications, and the MS in taxation. All right, I'll jump into um, some information about really what makes our, our business school unique, what, what makes um, Gabelli Gabelli, so to speak. Um, so first and foremost, New York City. So I, saw, I think there was three people who've been to New York. Um, so I'll, I'll try my best to describe kind of how New York operates and how it's, it's uh, a, a location that really uh, serves as a, as a major advantage for, for our business school students. Um, so this slogan here, New York is my campus, Fordham is my school. Um, there is a lot of reality behind that slogan. Uh, we are located, the business school is located uh, right on 60, between 60th Street and 62nd Street on the west side of Manhattan. So um, really in the heart of New York City. We're right next to Central Park. We're about two blocks away. Um, 
I know Times Square, that's a place you'll, you'll uh, once you come to New York for about a month and are there, you'll, you'll become a local and you'll, you'll know to stay away from Times Square because it's all tourists. But just so you know, we're about a 10 minute walk away from Times Square. We're right in the middle of everything. And that, that proximity to these major companies, as I mentioned before, is extremely important. Um, you know, that, that ability to be able to email an alum and say, you know, hi, my name is Dylan. I'm here for a year, two years. Um, I'm really interested in pursuing a career in marketing. Um, I'd love to have a, a cup of coffee with you uh, to learn a little bit more about what you do. Uh, and you can tell these alums, hey, I'm here for a year. You name the day, you name the place. I'll come to you. It can be tomorrow. It can be two weeks from now. It can be a month from now. Um, you, you are approaching these networking opportunities with a degree of flexibility that I think is extremely significant when it comes to your chances of making these connections. So, so to give it a, you know, another perspective, I, I have a really good friend who, uh, he's at a great MBA program outside of New York. Uh, and they actually fly their MBA students to New York to do networking you know, over the course of two to three days uh, every semester. And he was telling me it's, it's nearly impossible to schedule the meetings that you want to schedule because you're there for 48 hours. You know, you're sending emails to an executive saying, you know, hi, I'm Dylan. Uh, can you meet me between 2 to 4 p.m. on Thursday? There's a good chance that executive is out of the country, right, or has a meeting. You know, it's, it's a, a lot harder to be able to, to secure those one-on-one -on -one opportunities. Um, whereas our students, it's, it's an approach where you say, you, you tell the alum that they're in control of when this meeting happens, because it will take you at most 20 minutes on a subway to get to that company to go and meet that, that alum. So just one thing to point out, do not underestimate the value of the proximity to these companies and to the alumni that work at these companies. As you can see, we have uh, nearly 10,000 Fordham alums that still work in the New York tri-state area. So whatever industry you're looking to break into, uh, we have an alum in that industry. There's no doubt about it. Um, and beyond even New York City, we have 40,000 alums that are all over the world. So being able to, uh, you know, reach out to these alums, both in this local area of, of Manhattan, but also globally, that's a big part of your experience beyond the academics. Uh, and last, I just wanna also point out too, cause I think this is sometimes overlooked, but being where we are also means that you're, you have uh, a lot of access to guest speakers that come to our business school to, to you know, speak on a variety of topics. Um, and that again goes to the proximity piece. We have people who don't even live in New York who are there for a business trip uh, who come in and speak to our students. So um, I, don't, I don't know if any of you use Google Docs. Google Docs is, my life is on Google Docs. We actually had the co-founder come uh, a year ago to, to speak to our students. We had uh, the, the old mayor and, and billionaire Mayor Bloomberg was here six months ago. So um, again, that, that also gives our students this access to uh, to, to some incredible uh, guest speakers who, who, who come on campus to, to connect with the students. I, I want to spend a couple of uh, minutes talking about the, the graduate student organizations because this is another important aspect of your business school experience. Uh, it's getting involved in the community, getting involved um, with organizations that, that speak to the, the careers that you're looking to pursue or, or maybe some interests that you have. Um, oftentimes people, they come in and they think, well, clubs and organizations, that was an undergraduate thing. You don't do that at the graduate level. And it's quite the opposite. Uh, you know, our, our students, we encourage our students to get involved in these clubs and organizations because for one, it's a great opportunity to network. You know, you get to meet students that are uh, other students that are outside of your program at Gabelli. So, you know, for example, if you're in the finance society, you will meet students, MBA students, you'll meet, you know, quantitative finance students, you'll meet global finance students. Um, so again, just from an internal networking perspective, there's a lot of value in being able to, to connect with the, the students and other programs at the business school. Um, but the other piece of it too, is that there's a skill building component. 
right? For, you know, say you want to go into management consulting and you join the, the, the management consulting association, you know, a lot of the work that they do is, you know, practicing case interviews, practicing this, you know, this extremely cumbersome process of going through the interview, uh, you know, experience at, you know, say a, a, a McKinsey or a, a Deloitte. So uh, from a skill building standpoint, extremely important. Also from a, a community building networking perspective, it's extremely important to get involved um, in these clubs and organizations. And I do want to point out that, you know, the, the community feel that we have, uh, I'll, I'll get to the application requirements in a second, but I, I want to wrap up just by, um, you know, talking about how community is an extremely important aspect of our business school. We're, we're a Jesuit school, Fordham University is a Jesuit school. What we ex extract from this Jesuit identity is this sense of, of bettering the self and, and bettering the community. That's extremely important. It's a, uh, you know, a part of the experience that is really dictated from the top down, from the board of trustees down to the students that we select. Um, there's a reason why you are, in you are in classes with 25, 26 students and not 200 or 300 students. We value this small classroom environment where you get to speak your mind, you get to engage, you're in an active learning environment, you're getting to know your professors, you get to know your peers. You're not just going to be a number on an a, you know, attendance sheet, uh, you know, one of 200 or 300 person in a big lecture hall. Um, and, and again, that sense of community, that's, that's what we're about at Fordham. So I just wanted to, to point that out. Really, at the end of the day, what makes our business school our business school? It's this New York City identity, as well as our Jesuit identity. That's what makes Fordham Fordham at the end of the day. Um, okay, so now the, the fun stuff. Application requirements. So, uh, I, I'm going to go quickly through this list uh, and, and kind of walk you through how we go about evaluating these different aspects of your application. Um, but before I do, I just want to uh, uh, mention that we are looking at all of these different components and using what we call a holistic approach when we make our decision. I think it's really easy for students to to look at say a, a GMAT score or a GPA and say, that's how we determine if you're admitted or denied. If you have, you know, if you received a bad grade on an accounting class in your first year of undergrad, we're gonna take a big deny stamp and, and throw your application out. Um, that's simply not true. You know, I, I used to think that as well until I started working in this industry. But the reality is we're looking at all of these different uh, application components to make our decision. Uh, and the way I like to boil it down is that these all fall into two categories. You're either telling us about your story or you're giving us data. That's what we're, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at your data. We're looking at your story. And both matter when you're making a, you know, a, a, an admissions decision uh, on a student. So uh, just to go down the list, uh, a professional resume. So the resume is... Um, of the utmost importance for MBA students in particular. Uh, as I mentioned before, the MBA programs are differentiated by the fact that you need work experience. Um, and, and it needs to be work experience that is valuable um, and that will uh, you know, not only translate well for your contributions in the classroom, but also it will be something that an employer will look at and see as strong work experience and a, you know, a reason to hire you. So you know, that's, uh, you know, in particular for MBA students, I always tell them that we are looking at MBA students, both from the, the perspective of the fit with the business school, but we're also looking at you through the perspective of an employer. So if you're someone who's worked in, you know, let's say education for three, four, five years, uh, we have a lot of students that come from an educational background. Um, in your essay, if that, you know, that student says that they're looking to do big bulge bracket bank investment banking, that is a big leap. That is a major, major pivot. And so already then we're, we're going to be looking at, okay, is this a feasible career change for this student? Uh, and 
you know, oftentimes that takes us, you know, looking for evidence of quantitative abilities and things like that. But just know that that's really the first layer of our evaluation process for MBA students in particular. Looking at what you want to do, looking at what you've done, and making sure that that leap is something that is feasible. Because the last thing that we want to do is to, is to uh, lead you to fail, right? It, you know, at the end of the day, we have career development staff that help us uh, it, you know, in those occasions to determine the feasibility of a, of a career jump. We don't want you to invest a ton of money and then not get that career option. So just know that that's really the first layer is looking at that resume, evaluating the work experience and kind of tying it to what you want to do after the program. That's an extremely important part of the evaluation process for, for full-time MBA students. Um, and certainly that applies for MS students as well, right? If you have strong internships under your belt, uh, you know, in the industry uh, that, that you're looking to break into after your MS degree, that's going to help your case to get admitted because that makes you someone who is more employable, um, you know, in the eyes of, of an employer, okay? Uh, transcripts, so uh, fairly straightforward, you know, your, your transcript from your, your undergraduate institution and any other master's programs that you've um, pursued. One thing I'll mention with that is that we're not looking, uh, we are not looking specifically at your, you know, bottom line GPA and, and, and then not looking at your transcript again. We're, we're actually looking at the individual classes. We're looking at the classes that translate into the classes that you would take into the program. Um, so just something to, to take note of there. Uh, okay, GMAT, let's talk about the standardized test. This is, <laughs> I know this is the bane of, of every student's uh, existence when it comes to, um, you know, the standardized test uh, component. I, here's uh, uh, something, I'm, I'm not sure if, if you've received the, the update, but uh, we are actually making the GMAT and GRE optional for students in, in uh, this year's cycle. Um, a lot of that stems from COVID uh, in, uh, at the end of last year when the test centers shut down, it was extremely difficult for students to sit for exams. I think that's still the case today. Um, so we are making this an optional part of your application. If you have a test score that you feel will help your candidacy, by all means, submit that test score. Um, if you want to submit other things in lieu of a test score, so say, you know, any uh, online course that you've completed or any certifications that you might have that you think will strengthen your application, by all means, go, go that route. If you don't want to submit anything, that's okay. Um, at the end of the day, the, the reason we, we required, required, I should say, the, the GMAT and GRE is to get some sort of sense of your quantitative ability and your, your English proficiency level. Uh, and, you know, mainly the quantitative component was what we were extracting from those tests. So if you have any other supplemental materials that you think will help us evaluate your, your quantitative abilities, I, I would encourage you to, to submit it if you choose not to submit a test score. Uh, language exams, TOEFL, IELTS, uh, we also uh, allow you to, to pursue a, a Duolingo, um, you know, online course. Uh, you know, that's fairly simple. If you have not studied at an English speaking uh, university, then you have to submit some sort of, of language uh, exam. Um, essays, so essays will differ for each program. They, some of them will have different prompts, um, but at the end of the day, those essays help uh, us get a sense of who you are as an applicant. Uh, what are your motivations? You know, uh, why are you coming to business school? Where do you want to end up after business school? So being able to succinctly tell us, you know, here's why I want to come to business school. This is the type of career I want to embark on after I graduate. Here is why Fordham is a good fit. Um, those are really the main things we're looking to extract from, from the essay. Uh, recommendation letters, again, that's pretty straightforward. That, you know, those allow us to get a, some insight into the uh, you know, uh, the perspective of you either in the workplace or at your university, uh, some sort of external perspective. If you are an MBA applicant, we would uh, prefer that you are picking some sort of professional recommender. So someone who can uh, really speak to your abilities in the workplace. Um, 
And that could be a peer, that could be a, a, you know, a boss, that could be someone that you supervise. It doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is that it's someone who knows you well enough to, to give us, you know, some sort of clear perspective on, you know, your strengths in uh, when you're in a professional work environment. Um, and as far as MS, you know, we we're fine with academic uh, recommendation letters um, if you haven't worked full time. Uh, and then lastly, the interview. So the interview, uh, you know, that's a, an important part of the process as well. So once you've submitted all of the, you know, aforementioned requirements, um, you will go through an initial read with our uh, committee. And if you are a contender, you will be invited to, to do an interview. Uh, and once you've uh, you know, you've re you'll receive an invitation and most likely will be done virtually. Uh, and really the interview is an opportunity for you to ask questions, for you to expand on any, uh, you know, any part of your story that you feel you weren't able to include in your application. Um, and then from our perspective, it's a way to, to evaluate your presentation skills, you know, making sure that you're someone who, you know, presents professionally, um, you know, as well as, uh, you know, maybe ask questions about uh, certain areas of your application where um, there might, we might require, you know, additional insight. So that might be a, you know, a gap in employment, you know, for an MBA student or, or something of the like. Um, so these interviews are, are not meant to be, uh, you know, challenging. We're not meant, we're not going to ask you trick questions. Uh, you know, really we want these to be conversational. Uh, and, and as I said before, it's, you know, for us, there is an evaluative component, but really it's a great opportunity for you to be able to, to tell your story in more detail um, and ask whatever questions you might have. All right. Deadlines. This is fairly straightforward as well. So we have, uh, you know, the bulk of our student uh, of our programs, well, I should say all of our programs start in the fall. Um, we also have some programs, as you can see, the ones that are listed here, um, that start in the spring and in the summer. And you can see the, the respective deadlines for those programs. Um, you know, one thing I'll mention with the deadlines, and, and then I'll move on, because again, I think this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, it, you should apply when you feel your application is at its strongest. I, I always discourage students to rush an application because they feel they'll be evaluated differently in an earlier round versus a later round. The reality is our criteria never changes over the course of a cycle. We set the criteria for how we're gonna evaluate our candidates and that's gonna be the same round one, round three, round five, it doesn't matter. The only difference is when it comes to scholarships. And that's simple, that's a simple question of, a, you know, having a budget at the beginning of the year, uh, a pool of money that we can allot for scholarships. And obviously, as you move past, you know, generally round three, once you get to round four and round five, there is less money available uh, and more students, you know, looking for these scholarships. So it just becomes a little bit more competitive for scholarship dollars. So I, I always tell students that, you know, by, you know, if you're, if a scholarship is going to be an extremely important uh, reason for why you're coming to our business school, you should aim to apply, you know, by, by the round three deadline at the latest, which is January 22nd. All right, and here are the costs of the program. So, uh, you know, I'll keep this up here. I'm not going to list all of them, but you get a sense of, of, you know, what the tuition costs are. The main difference with the full-time MBA is that it's, uh, or any of our MBA programs, is that it's um, a, a flat tuition rate. It's not by the credit. Whereas for Masters of Science and actually our professional MBA, um, you're paying for the credits that you're taking at that given time, okay? There's also some fees that are associated with the program um, as well. So listen, as you can see here, this is a huge investment. I mean, this is a big investment of not only money, but of time as well. And so, you know, that's, that's one thing that, that we're very aware of. And, and I do want to spend maybe the last two to three minutes because I want to make sure you get a chance to, to ask your questions. Um, but financing your degree is something that, that we're really committed to, to helping you do. So uh, I mentioned scholarships before. Scholarships are... Uh, something that we determine for every applicant. So you don't have to submit an additional 
uh, application or anything like that to receive a merit-based award. We evaluate all students during the application process for scholarships. Um, for the full-time MBA, we are extremely generous when it comes to merit-based scholarships. We, the, the smallest amount you could receive is $30,000 the highest award you can receive is what's called our Dean's Premier Scholarship. And that is a, a scholarship that offers full tuition and expenses covered, meaning you're not paying a thing to, to attend the business school. Uh, and on top of that, we give you $20,000 for your housing. So we're essentially paying you to, to come to our MBA program. Um, and as I mentioned, we give about five students every year one of those scholarships. Um, for the uh, remainder of the full-time MBA students, we, th those scholarships will fall in $10,000 increments between $30,000 and the full tuition amount. Um, and just to give you some stats, uh, last for the last year, we gave about 70% of our students some sort of merit-based scholarship, um, and the average award was uh, right around $60,000. Um, for the specialized Masters of Sciences, the, the uh, awards are a little bit smaller. Um, the, the programs are not as, as expensive as the, the full-time MBA. Uh, they range from $10,000 to, to $30,000. And again, the criteria is, is going to be the same, um, you know, as far as looking at your data and your story. And if you are above average, you know, that will, that will dictate your, your scholarship amount. Um, other funding opportunities, so graduate assistantships, um, those are essentially on-campus jobs where your, your pay is in the form of tuition remission. Meaning if you work 20 hours a week uh, in the admissions office or in the career development center, you will receive uh, a little bit more than $7,000 subtracted from your tuition bill. Um, and there are different types of graduate assistantships. You can work in administrative units like admissions. You can also work with faculty members. You know, you can uh, help them with their research, help them with grading for their courses, etc. So that is another common way that a lot of our students will, um, you know, help fund their, their education. And then uh, find, you know, as far as student loans. So uh, you know, for because I think most of you are, are predominantly international, I, I do want to mention a, a, a company that you might have already heard of called Prodigy Finance. Um, you know, they are uh, probably one of the best options for receiving loans as an international student looking to study in the U.S. Um, so they limit their, their uh, partnerships to business schools that are in the top 100, uh, uh, you know, ranking from the Financial Times. And we're lucky to be on that list. So we actually are, we have a lot of students who, who come to us uh, and, and have their, their uh, tuition subsidized or, or helped by the, the Prodigy Finance folks. Um, they offer the most competitive rates as far as I know. Uh, they also don't require a co-signer. So definitely something to look at if you're, if you're looking to study in the US, um, you know, they, they typically uh, have, have really helped our students. And another one of those programs is Empower Finance. Um, so take a look at, at either of those two. All right. Sorry, Federica, if I went a little long there, but um, I did want to convey all of that information. But I think we're, we're ready for questions. I'll leave this slide up here. As you can see, this is the contact information uh, for the different admissions officers that represent all of these programs. So um, if you guys have any questions, please uh, reach out to, to any of my colleagues. If you're interested in the full-time MBA, by all means, reach out to me. Uh, we're, we're more than happy to help. Thank you so much, Dylan. Thank you so much for the presentation. Everything was uh, very clear. We do have actually lots of questions. So let's start with um, the, one of the first one. So they're asking us if classes at the moment are in campus or remote. Yeah, great question. So COVID, yeah, COVID, man, that has, uh, that has I think, uh, uh, caused a lot of changes for, for business schools across the world. So right now we are, we gave our students two options for how they could uh, pursue their, their course of study. They could either do everything online uh, or they could do a hybrid uh, course of study where they're essentially in class for about 50% of their class sessions and the rest are online. Um, and that's obviously to, to you know, lessen the number of students that are in the business school at a given time. The majority of students have actually pursued the hybrid approach where they're, they're in New York City, um, they're coming to the business school maybe two or three days out of the week. 
Um, and then for those students that couldn't make it to New York or you know, they weren't able to get a visa appointment because the visa centers have been shut down, we still give them that opportunity to pursue uh, you know, their education synchronously online. Thank you so much. Another question is about, you mentioned about Argentina, London, you mentioned about the trips. So basically they're asking if there is a certain criteria for students in order to be enrolled into this specific um, activity. And after they're asking if a bachelor in engineering can actually, uh, if this person is, is eligible for the full-time MBA program. Yeah, I'll answer that second part first. Absolutely. We have engineers uh, across all different types of engineering that, that come into the program. And I would actually say that engineering is a type of skill that actually translates extremely well in the business world. And that's not just me saying that, that's employers who say that as well. So uh, simple answer to that is yes, by all means you're eligible. Uh, and then for you know, the trips, you know, there is no criteria. If you're admitted into the program, you're going to Argentina, you're going to London. It's actually a mandatory part of the program. You're, you're, you can't graduate unless you do those two trips. So um, no criteria at all. It's if you're someone who we feel is strong enough to do well in our MBA program, you will be going on those trips and, and doing those consulting projects. Perfect. We have another question from Maria talking about the background. So basically, what is the profile of the students that apply uh, to Gabelli? So for example, she mentioned is mainly economy, marketing, international relations, or so what sort of cohorts there will be? Yeah, great question. So for the full-time MBA, um, you know, that's, that's of the utmost importance for us that we're bringing in students from different backgrounds because especially in the type of format that we offer, which is small class sizes, you know, active learning where people are giving their perspectives. We need people from different backgrounds because if we had a classroom full of people who worked in investment banking, there would be a very <laughs> narrow way of looking at business problems. You need people who, who come from different backgrounds. So um, the cohort in the last couple of years, I would say about 17%, was between 17 and 20% uh, come from financial services. Um, we've also had, uh, you know, a good chunk of people come from marketing in the last couple of years, um, usually a little bit north of 10%. And then the rest kind of fall across all different types of backgrounds. Engineering, like I mentioned before, we've had people who've served in the military, uh, people who've worked in education. That's another thing I want to point out is that I think someone who works in a non-business field may feel like they're not eligible for an MBA. Uh, couldn't be further from the truth. We want people from all different types of backgrounds, uh, even if it's a non-traditional background. Um, so yes, there is a, a really great diversity as far as professional experience. I'll also mention that of the 70 to 80 students that we have in the cohort, we have a great geographic diversity as well. We have um, uh, this year, 23 countries represented out of the, the 80 students in the cohort. So again, a lot of different perspectives that are, that are contributing to the discussion. You actually answered another question because we did have Alejandra that she asked how many foreigner students are at Gabelli every year. And she's also wondering if the application is competitive. So how many people are actually applying every year? Yeah, another good question. So it, the competitiveness of the application is going to differ for every one of the programs. Um, you know, for the MS programs, you know, quantitative finance is extremely competitive. That's a program where, uh, you know, you're looking at, you know, less than 30% than are, are admitted uh, because it's a very technical degree. It's, it's one where, you know, we, we want to make sure the student will be successful in, in the classroom. Um, for the MBA, it's right around 44% of our students are admitted. Uh, into the, the full-time MBA. And again, what I would encourage you to do, just because I know we're, we're short on time, is, is to reach out to, you know, any of these admissions officers if, you know, uh, you're interested in one of those programs and they'll be able to give you the specific numbers for, for their respective programs. Thank you. We actually have two similar questions which I think are very interesting. So what's the best way to get prepared if I wish to apply, for example, in a couple of years? And another question is, um, what if I'm actually a little bit younger than what the program required? Can I still apply or should I wait? And maybe in those two years or a year, what should I do? Yeah, uh, I love those questions because I think that's such, uh, that means you're, you're, you're 
thinking about this process as a long-term thing, which it should be. It should not be, I mean, you, th this is ex expensive and it's also a commitment of time and it can be a transformational experience, but it requires you to do the work on the front end to make sure that you're, you're making the right fit. So my, my recommendations for students is that you have to work at the end and work backwards. It doesn't go the other way around. You don't pick the business school, you don't pick the program and then kind of figure out, oh, and then I guess I'll do this afterwards. You have to do a lot of research on what you, really where you see yourself career-wise, what you want to do on a day-to-day -day basis, what type of company you want to work at. And then once you've established that, you've you then look at business schools that have a history of sending people into these types of jobs that have alums that work in these types of positions uh, and, and, and kind of go from there. So, uh, you know, there was the question about, you know, if, if you're a little bit young, I definitely encourage you to, to take, you know, even two years to do this process is, is usually what it, it, it can require for some students where you're spending months doing the career work as far as where you want to end up and then months doing the business school work that could be an entire year and then that other year is spent preparing your application for those business schools um so yeah i think you know don't rush this decision it's it's a it's a really it, it can be transformational but only if you put in the work and make sure that you're picking a business school that's that's going to be the right fit Thank you. Another question is about, um, can I stay in New York after the master's or do I actually need a work visa? Is someone from Europe? Yeah, so you can, if it's a, if it's a STEM program, you, you get those additional, uh, uh, you get to, to stay in New York for three years. Um, if it's a non-STEM program, um, it's one year. And then regardless, you know, if it's, you know, after the three years or after the one year, you will need to get a, a, a work visa. Uh, or essentially sponsored from the company. Um, so, you know, that, listen, that is a, uh, uh, that makes jobs for international students much more competitive. There's no doubt about that. You know, the, it's a very competitive market. There are a lot of, you know, international students that are looking for jobs in New York and companies have limited spots. So that's why, especially for international students, working with our Career Development Center is so, so important because they know the types of companies that hire international students. They, they, they really kind of help uh, set the guidelines that you will need to follow to be able to stay in New York for a longer period of time because the reality is it, it's extremely competitive. Thank you so much. Another question is about, so you mentioned companies and we mentioned internship during the presentation. Are these internships only in the US or also Europe or maybe somewhere else? Yeah, so the, the majority of students will stay in New York um, and that's you know, simply because of, you know, that's where they make the connections, right? They go, they meet an alum who works at Amazon. You know, Amazon is about 10 minutes away from us. And so they, they meet someone there and if that, if that alum likes them, they'll, they want them to work in their office, right? They, they don't want to ship them off somewhere else. Uh, but it's not a requirement to stay in New York. And certainly, if you're looking to work in a specific location, you, our career development staff will encourage you to apply for internship positions in that location. Um, so th the majority of students are in New York, but it's by no means a requirement. We've had students who've worked in Berlin. We've had students who worked in London. We had students who interned in Los Angeles. So it really depends on where you want to end up after the program. Thank you. Maria is talking about requirements. So before you had the slide that actually summarized all the requirements. And is there anything different for foreign students? Maybe refer to the GPA they have to uh, have their transcript or like maybe do a conversion of the GPA if anything changes for them? Yeah, that's a, 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 an important question. So, you know, certainly the language exam, right, is an additional requirement. Um, and then for the transcripts, we require a transcript evaluation. Uh, so uh, through uh, WES, there are a couple of others that, that provide these, these transcript evaluations. Um, that, that will have to be submitted as well. Um, and we do know that there is a backlog. I think that's COVID related, that it takes a while for these evaluations to come in. Just know that we, we are all trained to evaluate transcripts in different countries. So we will move your application forward, even if that evaluation comes in later. 
at the end of the day, we will need one just to, to make everything official. Um, but just know that, you know, don't, don't lose sleep over the fact that your evaluation might come in two to three weeks late. Um, so yeah, that's a, a good question. Those are really the two differences for, for international students. Thank you. We're coming towards the end, but I think there is a question that is important to actually remind. So it's about deadlines. So Lucia is asking us when will be the next deadline for application. So I know you had the slide just maybe before closing to remind everyone. So there you go. So October 23rd, that's the, wow, that's nine days away. This all moves so fast. Uh, so nine days away uh, is, the, is the first deadline, um, and then you can see the, the remaining deadlines there for fall. Uh, and the way it works is we, we evaluate um, on a rolling basis within the deadline. So if you apply earlier uh, than the October 23rd deadline, you'll likely get a decision earlier, you know, uh, and, and that works for all of these deadlines. If you apply for round two before November 20th versus on November 20th, that will help dictate when you receive your decision. Um, the, the other thing I'll mention is that if you're looking for a quick decision, uh, sign up for an earlier interview because no decision can be rendered until an interview is complete. So if you are a contender, we will send you that email saying sign up for an interview slot. Uh, just know that it's usually about two weeks after you've had your interview that you'll receive your decision. Uh, talking about the interviews, I actually had a question. Are those interviews um, online or you actually need to go to New York and get your international students to have your interview? I, I, I would all love for you to come to New York. Uh, it would be a great way for, for you guys to come and, and get your interview in person and, and see the city. But the majority of, of interviews are, are virtual. If uh, And let me put a caveat on that. I think all interviews are going to be uh, virtual at least for the first three rounds, uh, given COVID. Uh, but normally what our policy is, is if you're in New York, or if you're you know, traveling to New York and you wanna do your interview in person, by all means, you can do it in person, but otherwise we, we conduct them via Zoom. Um, and I think it, they'll all be via Zoom uh, for uh, these first three rounds and, and you know, possibly even, even the remaining rounds. Thank you so much. So we actually come towards the end of this live presentation. I'd like to thank Dylan for his time tonight. And just before closing, we actually, uh, we answer a lot of your questions. We wanted to ask you one final question about this webinar. So we do hope that you actually found this webinar useful. Um, as Dylan mentioned, um, there will be some email address that you can actually contact if you do have any questions, we will be sending you a follow-up email after this webinar. So it will be all of the information, all the useful links about application, and also there will be an email address that you can contact in case you have any more questions. And um, it's actually great to see that the majority thinks that this was useful. Um, thank you so much. And we, we hope to see you soon at the next um, Gabelli School of Business webinar and hopefully if you put an application through and you get admitted you will get to meet Dylan in person so thank you right so here much. At our business school. that's our business school right there <laughs> <laughs> perfect thank you so much Dylan for your time and the presentation great. and uh, have a great evening everyone or if you're not in Europe then have a great rest of your day thank you so much